Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. I'm so thrilled uh, to have you all here. And currently, I am making Rod and Stuart co-host as well, in case they feel like doing anything fun, like muting people um, <laughs> inadvertently or intentionally, um, yeah. or not, of all of those fun things. Uh, so I'm just letting people kind of like jump in, but to all of you who are here, thank you so much for coming. I'm so thrilled to have you guys here. Hello, Renee. Hello, Trent. Hello, Julie. Hello, John. Hello, Mom. Hello, Janet. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Deborah. Um, we've got uh, some wonderful, um, I'm so excited about this today and I have been. One thing I want to address, I was just telling, saying to talking to Rod and Stu about this, um, I'm getting a little bit of delay on my end. Uh, I think it, I think it might be originating from my connection. So I'm super sorry, you guys, if there's a little bit of jumbleness. Um, I haven't had any issues yet with um, the um, audio, so it seems to be doing pretty good. It's just like every once in a while I start to freeze, like right now. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. being frozen. <laughs> every minute. Every <laughs> every minute on the minute. So we can count um, down how long we're going to be on the the show for then. <laughs> But well, yeah, probably. But um, but hopefully, hopefully it won't interrupt anything that Rod and Stu are going to share with us today, um, which is so great. So uh, for those of you, I know we have a few more people I think who are going to be jumping on. But in the meantime, for those of you who are here and those of you who have these beautiful, beautiful wines, these four amazing wines that we have, um, I was just going to uh, mention that we have two whites and two reds, and that we are going to. Um, take them side by sides because we're going to kind of do the comparison um, of the Sauvignon Blancs and the Syrahs. So if you do have two glasses, I would recommend pulling that out, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. So hello, everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm talking too much right now because I would like to introduce you all to uh, these two fabulous, fabulous men from New Zealand. Um, and my Zoom left is uh, winemaker Rob McDonald, and then to my Zoom right is Stuart Devine as well. So hello, hello. Um, how are you doing? And I, yes, everyone, how are you doing? You feel free to use the chat box. You guys can unmute yourselves. We're a small group, so feel free to jump right on in as soon as it makes you happy. Um, here we are. We got a few more people coming in. So. Um, what what I'm planning to start with, for those of you who've been to some of these past ones, you know how, how fun it is and how exciting it is to hear everyone talk about this. If you have your wine ready, excellent. Um, in the meantime, what I'd like to do is, if, if you don't mind, just Rod and Stu introducing yourselves um, and, and saying a little bit about, because you'll, I, I'd love to let them uh, meet you on your words. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks, Sasha. Hey, so um, I'm Rod. Uh, so I'm uh, it's Saturday afternoon here. So just after lunch. Uh, so we've got some, um, you've got a view of Hawke's Bay out to your um, behind me. So um, that's sort of, uh, that's, we're just on the edge of town. So that's the farm and then the coast in the distance. And, um, and so uh, it's just starting to cloud over. We had a, a beautiful start to the day, but um, but it's just starting to cloud over now. So um, uh, I've been in Hawke's Bay for about th just on 30 years now, about 28 years, and, uh, and moved here to, to make wine um, and ended up uh, loving it and staying, um, meeting my lovely wife, Jo, um, three kids and a business later, and, um, and that's kind of where we're at. Um, uh, and a bit of a wine tragic. Um, I've been doing it for 30 years, so, so I'm kind of a one trick pony. <laughs> So I'm um, looking forward to uh, telling you all about these wines and uh, a little bit about Hawke's Bay and a little bit about how we farm them and how we make them and, and, um, and what it's like to live in New Zealand. So as, as much as you would like to hear, we can talk about sheep. If we run out of things to talk about with wine, we can talk about rugby. Um, <laughs> don't ask me about American football because you'll be disappointed. Um, I don't, uh, I just don't understand it. I'm trying though. I'm learning. Uh, and ice hockey is even worse. So uh, basketball, I could probably hold a conversation, but that'd be about it. Um, and so, yeah, that's me. And I've, that, um, so Stu, <laughs> Stu is our man on the ground in the US. Well, he's, he's on the ground in New Zealand at the moment. Yeah. But, um, so hi guys. I've known so, Stu for probably yeah, 
25 years. Yeah, we are in two different sort of angles of the wine business right here, obviously, right? Because yeah. you talk about what you do. Yeah, so yes. Stu, you know, before yeah. he talks, because he'll okay. take over. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to him. <laughs> hey, uh, so I used to, when I started at Villa Maria, I was part of the uh, winemaker at Vitals, part of the Villa Maria group. Stu was um, the viticulturalist that uh, I got assigned to, or he got assigned to me. So he looked after all my growers and grapes in Hawke's Bay um, while I was there, and then, uh, and then ended up moving to America and running that for Villa. So he'll tell you all about that, but... Um, um, in some ways, like if in some planets or in some um, organizational charts, I was kind of his boss and he just loves it when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not anymore. Ooh. Breaks my heart. Uh, <laughs> That's how so, I remember it, isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of not. But anyway, hey guys, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm uh, originally from Hawke's Bay, so Rod says he's lived there for 30 years. I think I left Hawke's Bay uh, 17 years ago, so um, 40 years. So I'm a Hawke's Bay person for 40 years. I was a viticulturalist, had my own vineyard, had my own apple orchard. I do understand American football. I lived in New York for six years. Um, so um, unfortunately, guys, I supported the Jets at the time, mainly because uh, everyone else around me liked the Giants. So I was kind of like, nah. I want to support what they did. Um, love ice hockey, good game. But really, what what I what I do now uh, is is help sell two really cool New Zealand portfolios. Paddy Borthwick, he lives about three hours south of Rod, um, and of course Rod McDonald in um, Hawkes Bay. And then I live four hours north of Rod in a little uh, surfing beach called Waihi Beach. So it's nothing like Newport Beach, um, but it does um, have the Pacific, and our Pacific is on the east, but yours is on the west. It's always very difficult to get that around your head. Um, you always want to turn right, where you should be turning left. You get the west and the east wrong, uh, as you can imagine. So anyway, um, due to uh, COVID, unfortunately, um, I, I can't travel, leave New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand is very much uh, a locked down. Well, that's not quite true, is it, Stu? You could travel, but you're just worried you didn't, we, won't, we won't let you back in. Yeah, well, it'd be hard to get back <laughs> in there. They, uh, the thing is, when you come to New Zealand, you've got to um, lock down for two weeks in a hotel um, and not allowed to leave it. Um, and, ah, and it's just too difficult to, to, and everything's a bit screwed up at the moment. So this year, normally I spend the spring and autumn traveling around the States. So I do know Orange County really well. Um, in fact, uh, I've got, well, he's not Orange County, he's in Pasadena. I have a good mate in Pasadena, so I'll go there and stay there. Um, so we're very lucky today to be showing you Rod's wines. Um, and, and, and I talked to Sasha into doing two of each, so you can see the difference. Because one of the things that you'll notice straight away is that there's going to be a vintage uh, difference. And Rod will get into that, because uh, most Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand that you guys would see on the floor is 2019 or soon it'll be 2020. Um, where Hawke's Bay is a little different. Again, Rod will get into that. And, and you know, historically, Sauvignon Blancs were never meant to be shown the week after they were harvested. But um, that's kind of the corporate mulber that has occurred. So anyway, um, without further rambling on for me we've got election day here too today guys so i oh, walked to the, i walked down to the village and and voted uh for uh we, we we've got mmp so um uh, first past the post so we we basically get to vote um for uh no it's not first it's mmp yeah first the first vote we get is for the member of our region like state and then the second one is the, the which party we want to um, vote for. So we have about a, 10 parties. That we can vote for. Anyway, so that'll be going on today. And we will most probably have the same Prime Minister, hopefully, by the end of the day. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, Rod, I believe you, Rod go. you guys will uh, get on and, and start uh, talking about them. Yeah, Thanks, we can start talking about some wine. Why not? Mm. <laughs> Cheers. So everyone, if you do have two glasses, yes, cheers. By all means, everyone. Uh -huh. Then it's already back. into it. Good on you. <laughs> Absolutely.
Um, so yeah, if you oh, do have the two on. glasses and you can pour them side by side, uh, this will be delightful to do a comparison. Because I feel like this is the most exciting thing that I got, um, that I was so excited about this. And Stu, like, you really didn't have to twist my arm too much to do four wines, obviously. <laughs> because I do think there's very little opportunity for us to sit down and taste um, you know, single varietals from something so close when you get into like partial to parcel or even clone to clone, it's so exciting to kind of see how much difference terroir can kind of make in a, in a given, not like in different parts of the world, but in the same place pretty much. So um, I will let Rod take it away from here because he is the one with the divine mind. <laughs> but he just muted himself. <laughs> I, did I just muted myself because my son's just asked me a question. Oh. Um, I'll be one second. Hang on. Okay. In the meantime, then I will keep talking. <laughs> and or Stu, if you'd like to get in. But um, obviously, we are talking about Sauvignon Blanc here. And so, um, Hawks Bay. For those of you who don't remember or were not in the um, the class that we did last month on Australia and New Zealand, um, it is on the North Island, and it is along the sort of uh, southeastern sort of portion of the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand. So. Uh, it's a very, very famous region. It's one of the most prolific kind of North Island regions in terms of production, I believe. Um, you got it. So we're the second yeah. biggest region in, in New Zealand after Marlborough. Um, and we used to be the largest region in New Zealand before Marlborough really got underway. So, so Hawke's Bay is the oldest um, sort of uh, commercially planted wine region in the country. We've had grapes here for about 140 years, I think it is. And, uh, and New Zealand's oldest, two oldest wineries are here in the Bay um, with Tomato Estate and the Mission. So um, it's kind of the, the cradle of the industry in some ways in terms of that sort of traditional planting. And, and it was originally planted by um, like uh, immigrants from Europe um, and particularly England. Um, and so a lot of those early plantings um, have really followed the models of the old world around planting on river terraces and old river beds and sort of estuaries and right by the sea. So much the same as Bordeaux. And, and then um, um, we have, like as an industry, progressed um, mostly around planting on f relatively flat land. Um, and um, obviously that's where the old river beds are. Um, but also uh, it's allowed the industry to sort of grow really quickly. And um, so the vineyards, particularly in Marlborough, um, are more um, on the flatlands. And it's only now that we're starting to really discover the potential of um, some of those um, uh, harder to work, but um, sort of magnificent slopes and, and river terraces that, um, that you can uh, see planted all through Europe. Not as cheap or as easy to farm, yeah. but um, we're getting some stunning results from a wine quality point of view. How so. much, um, in terms of terracing, and how much, how much slope on average is there compared to flat land in Hawke's Bay in particular? I reckon you'd probably say 95 to 97% would be planted on flats, okay. on flat land, and there'd be like three or 4% on slopes. So this is if relative, you, but expanding? Expanding, um, okay. expanding, but, but it's, it's um, if I can put it into, into a, into a hasty, hastily imagined context, it's mm -hmm. like you have to be able to sell it for $50, $100 a bottle to make it worth planting on the side of a hill because the, all the extra handwork and the extra costs of establishment and, and all of that, the way you harvest and, and every aspect of it, um, you can't do it and sell the wine for $15 a bottle. And so it takes a long time and a lot of effort to develop a market for those more expensive wines. So, so I think it's growing relatively quickly, but it's a relatively small part of the market. And it, I think it'll continue to as people get excited about the quality that comes out of Hawke's Bay and out of New Zealand at that fine wine end. I think you'll see it further develop, but um, it'll be a slow grow, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. That's Exciting though. I mean, some of our best, absolutely, um, uh, hand on heart, I think probably of the 10 most exciting wines coming out of Hawke's Bay, red or white, I would say eight of them are coming off hillsides. Really? So I think... So, so they, Rod, um, if you look... Excuse me, Rod, if you look at hillsides versus land, most land vineyards crop somewhere around about 10 to 15 pounds of vine. So you think about that, 10 or 15 pounds of grapes are hanging on vines. If you go to a hill, they'll be cropping somewhere between one and two pounds per vine. Yeah. So yeah. there's a little rule that you, get, you try and get a bottle of wine off a of, off of vine. On a hill. 
you're going to get one bottle off a vine. <laughs> Where on the flat land, uh, say you did 15 pounds, just for argument's sake, how many litres are there? Now that's, that's sort of like nearly a, nearly a case, and you would get eight bottles off a vine. So yeah. it's quite a big difference. Okay, that's yeah. me, shut up. Um, I was trying. I was thinking something similar this morning as I was thinking about what we were going to talk about today, and I was trying to convert. Um, we talk in uh, tons per hectare, yeah. and the Europeans talk in hectolitres per hectare. Yeah. And I was thinking, okay, so what's that gallons per acre? I wonder what that would be. But I didn't. I couldn't do the maths in my head, so I ended up with um, tons per acre. So our fine wine would be around a ton and a half, two tons per acre. Yeah. And our um, our more sort of um, the so the Mister sort of um, uh, mm -hmm. that sort of mid-tier, that mid-tier, we're more like about um, about three and a half tonnes an acre. So okay. one and a half up to three and a half would probably be the difference in terms of yield per hectare. And that's and that's really comes to the crux of the difference in price between these two wines. It's all about uh, yield per hectare, like how much return off a particular piece of land um, and, and, and transfer transferring that into the grape cost, the cost of growing the grapes. So that's the biggest difference in, in the way that the pricing ultimately ends up in the bottle. Um, yeah. That said, there's, there's more expensive winemaking because of the, um, the, uh, the use of oak and imported French oak barrels, but also um, the maturation time, um, Stu alluded to before, um, you know, with a tank fermented Sauvignon Blanc, Within three or four months of harvest, you can be in the market selling it. But with our quarter acre Sauvignon, which we're going to try shortly, um, you know that's a that's a twelve month undertaking to from harvest to bottling before it then hits the market after it's rested for another few months after bottling before we release it into the marketplace. So, um, so so perhaps if we um, that's a natural segue into tasting a couple of wines, maybe. Sounds great. Yeah. I think that's a perfect segue. Well okay. done, sir. <laughs> Um, no moving parts. You can't smell the smoke. <laughs> um, so, so I've poured the mister into my left glass and the and the um, quarter acre into my right. Um, and so, so we're looking. I think for you guys, we're on a 2006, 2018 mister and a two thousand and sixteen yeah. quarter acre. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty exciting, honestly. Yeah. Um, when, with that vintage, I was pretty, I was pretty pumped about getting that because I think you're going to tell us probably all about how exciting that is. <laughs> gonna try. Um, uh, so the thing about um, and Stu alluded to it before. Um, Hawks Bay seems the Hawks Bay Sauvignon seems to seems to really hit its straps after um, sort of a vintage behind. So so we don't rush to get these wines in the bottle. So we bottled the eighteen Mister Sauvignon probably in about um, January February just before harvest in twenty in twenty nineteen, and then. Uh, and then into your market uh, end of last year. And then so we'll be releasing the, the 2019 about now. Um, so so the, we're just about through the 18, 19 is just about to arrive. And then we'll be into the 2020 about this time next year, or maybe a little bit sooner. Um, you guys are getting a bit thirsty. So we've got to up our bottling, uh, bottling rate and release rate, which is, um, which is really cool. We're delighted. Um, <laughs> So, so that's kind of typical for where we see the, the, our sort of tank fermented Sauvignon from Hawke's Bay. We're sort of one vintage behind where Marlborough normally sits. And as Stu said, um, that, that push for early release Marlborough is all about um, the commercials of, of um, those big production wineries. Um, I don't think anyone would tell you that Sauvignon Blanc tastes its best within, within three months of harvest but it's a commercial reality of the style that it's possible to market it and sell it three months after harvest. Um, and it still tastes like it should, you know, it still tastes bright and fruity and all that sort of stuff. But I don't think anyone argue that it's, that it's at its best, you know? Um, and then with the Sauvignon Blanc, the quarter acre, that's a definitely a different proposition. That's really um, uh, at another 10 to 11 months um, resting on lees and barrel. Um, before it's um, um, bottled and then left to sit in our cellar for about six months before we release it. Um, and so with the, with the two wines, and we can talk about it a little bit more, um, the, the idea with the Sauvignon Blanc, the quarter acre, is that with the barrel fermentation, the way we grow the grapes and we may, the way we process the fruit and, and barrel ferment it, it all adds to the ageability and the, and the sort of complexity of the wine. Um, and, and with both of them, um, 
um, we're really trying to make the most of the difference between, you know, growing grapes in Hawke's Bay compared to Marlborough, compared to Wairarapa, compared to the Loire, you know. Um, we're really trying to make the most of what uh, Hawke's Bay has to offer. So, Out of curiosity, so when we're talking about these two wines, obviously, um, how far apart physically are these properties that are these grapes are growing in? So obviously we're all in Hawke's Bay, but Hawke's Bay is a, a large place, for example. So. Yeah. Um, how how far how different are the actual is the actual terroir and what is that like between these two particular um, yeah. plots of land? So um, so uh, the wine on the left, the Mister, is a blend of two vineyards basically, um, or two areas within Hawke's Bay. Uh, one is is um, is actually the same vineyard that the quarter acre comes from, ah. and so that's at Mangatahi. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that vineyard. So that's about 20 miles in from the coast. And it's at about, um, about 700 feet elevation um, above sea level. And so as you head towards the mountains, um, you obviously, um, you're, you're going upstream. So you're going to the closer to the headwaters of the river and, uh, and you're gaining altitude. So, so what that means from a climate point of view is that it's much cooler at night and the sea has a much lesser influence on the um, daytime temperatures um, because you're so far inland, you don't get the effect of those sea breezes. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is um, cooler at night means um, it protects your acidity through the heat of summer. And so you end up at harvest time with this beautifully elevated acidity and elevated acidity gives you um, better um, aromatic definition. So you get this beautiful um, uh, a wider range, I guess, of, um, of aromatics, the spectrum of the flavors that you can smell or the um, flavors you can smell. Um, Thank you, Stu. <laughs> hey, look at that. There you go. Brilliant. 48.6 kilometers. That's about 20 miles, isn't it? I'm not yeah, so great on I the maths. So. Yeah. Your maths, um, yeah, it works for me, I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you, the, the impact is on the acidity and those, um, that acidity creates a different spectrum of, um, of aromatics in terms of not only do you get the typical sort of capsicum and, and um, gooseberry characters you get in Sauvignon Blanc, but in Hawke's Bay, what you see is more typically um, quite limey, um, um, almost yeah. grapefruit um, uh, characters. You get a little bit of red currant. But you also get this beautiful passion fruit sort of aroma, which um, you say comes red through. currant. You feel like red currant is one of your tasting yeah. notes for Hawks Bay. Wow! Yeah, for sure. What a fun one. And then, uh, so that's that's the Mangatahi part of the um, or Marai Kakaho. That's the part of the vineyard that um, uh, fifty percent of the relative, yeah, you know, around fifty percent of the. Um, Mr. Blend comes from Mangatahi. The other 50% comes from here, the Rob? coast. Yeah, around there. Yep. So the other um, the other 50% comes from the coast at Tiwonga. And so um, in the um, in the vineyard out at the coast, we've got about uh, the vines were planted in about 1994. So we've got vines that are about 26 years old now. Um, and we harvest the fruit in about, um, well, it's, it's probably about two, it's at least two weeks later than the fruit that we harvest from inland, the inland really? block. Really? Um, yeah, it's about 30 oh, kilometers apart, later. so about 20 miles apart, but two weeks because, um, the wonderful thing about growing fruit right by the sea is you get the, you get the moderating effect of the, um, of the sea breeze morning and night. And so what happens is it extends your growing season because it never gets so hot. So the, the yeah. sort of um, the engine of the vineyard um, or the engine of the vine um, really operates at its, at its most efficient between say, um, uh, what is it, about 18 degrees and 26 degrees, 28 degrees, somewhere around there. Yeah. So that's Celsius. Stu, can you do the... It's okay. We, yeah. we, I think we're good with our Celsius. What was the temperature you're, you're wanting? Okay with so, so 30, 30 Celsius is 90 Fahrenheit, roughly. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, so sort of um, by, because of the moderating effect of the, temp, the sea breezes in the ocean right there, um, we get a much slower ripening period. So we have a much longer ripening period. So, so the difference in harvest of Sauvignon Blanc can easily be two weeks apart between our inland site 
and our yeah. coastal site. But the inland um, site, what you're saying is that without that kind of coastal influence, you're able to, the nights are actually cooler inland because you're almost getting more continental, right? So that's partially with keeping acidity, but you still get hot, hot like summer days there. Yeah, totally. And so in fact, the, the daytime temperatures are hotter at altitude inland than they are by the sea because the sea just knocks off the top two or three right. degrees. That makes sense. And so, um, and so what we find is partly, you know, a combination of old vines, um, kind of um, dry farming, a lot of the time at the coast wow. we don't have to irrigate out there and um and the effect of the sea breeze just means we have a much longer growing period so you get a very different spectrum of aromatics and flavor and a, a very different um sort of composition when you harvest of acidity and, and sugar and everything else and so the flavors um that we get from out there are more kind of you get this beautiful fennel bulb dill um, um again lime and citrus but um but probably a stronger, um, a stronger sort of herbal element. Not capsicum so much, but definitely a little bit of passion fruit, and definitely that um, that that sort of um, that, like I say, dill, um, fennel bulb, lemongrass yeah. kind of character. Yeah. Yes. Which yeah. Um, which uh, when when you blend it with what we get from Mangatahi, which tends to be more sort of passion fruit and slightly more yellower fruits and flavours, um, you get this lovely um, you get this lovely. Uh, sort of quite complex not in a not in a um hard to understand way but just in terms of a um a sort of a layered um aromatic and and a layered um fruit spectrum in <laughs> terms of the flavors of the wine fun to drink is that yours Rob? yeah yeah Sorry, <laughs> we've got a lot of guests happening over there <laughs> yeah we've got a that's that's a cricket. cricket the dog um my son's just gone into the village and she's barking at him telling him off because she's left him but he's left her at home <laughs> Um, that's <laughs> so that's the that's the mister. That's the mister. And so, um, which which wine came first, the Puerto Rico or the mister, in terms of the wine the label? Quarter acre. Okay. So the quarter acre Sauvignon was the first quarter acre wine we ever released um, back in about two thousand and twelve, and it really um, it really is the reason that we make it like we do now. Uh, what we did in 2011, which is the first year we... I got we Rod made, to do... I got Rod to do the mister. That's why they called it the mister, guys. <laughs> really? Wait, is that like a dance move or something? It's, the, it's my impression of the little dude on the label. Oh, okay. So the label was first, and that's just your impression? It's yeah. very good. I couldn't tell yeah. the difference. Thanks for sharing, Stu. Yeah. So pleased you came along, Stu. That's great. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, 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 you've lost my train of thought now. So when we first made the 2011 um, quarter acre, we did. Um, I was working by myself in the winery at that stage. We'd leased a little, a little sort of um, hundred ton winery, and um, and I pressed. Uh, we handpicked some Sauvignon from the coastal vineyard, so it was a hundred percent from the coast that year, and um, and we filled a single puncheon. So our total production of the first quarter acre Sauvignon was about 50 cases, 55 cases of finished wine. And it was um, run straight to a, a French puncheon, old used French puncheon, um, left on gross um, fruit solids. And then it was a natural ferment kicked off. Um, and I basically um, um, let the thing ferment and then topped it, bunged it and walked away for six months. Not literally, but um, we stirred it probably once a month. But we left it on gross leaves right through winter until the following really? spring. And so then, just um, for, sorry, just for clarification, punchin is a, a very large barrel, correct? So yeah, so uh, so a normal barrels the, the the most often used are barriques, and they're two hundred and twenty five liters. Right. So that's um, about forty five gallons, I think, isn't it? And then um, um, and then. Uh, punchins double that so 500 liters so it's really yeah. big and then when yeah. you're talking about leaving it on the gross leaves is that how does that compare to, is that basically like a skin maceration through fermentation like were they fermented on the gross leaves or no so um when you uh for those of you who squeeze your own orange juice so when you squeeze your orange juice it's cloudy um it's cloudy you put it in the fridge you come back the next day and it's settled and you've got clear juice on top and you've got the solid lumpy um, pithy bits at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So exactly the same thing happens with the grape juice. And so when you machine harvest and then you um, 
press and a, and a pneumatic airbag press that rolls around a few times during the process, you end up with cloudy juice sitting in the tank and then you come back the next day and you've got clear juice with solids at the bottom and then you take off the clear juice, put it in another, put it in another tank and ferment that and then you filter the juice leaves at the bottom and then add it back to the, to the big tank. And so that's a commercial way of making wine. When you hand pick fruit and you whole bunch press it and you do it in a basket press, um, the juice that you get is much less cloudy and it's much more, um, the, the, there's much less impact from the skins. And so, um, and the juice is exposed to the racky, the, like the, the, the bunch stalks as it's being pressed. And so what happens, the juice that you get from whole bunch pressing is much clearer and has a much lower percentage of, um, of uh, lees, juice lees. And so it's common, it's, um, in terms of the quarter acre wines, it's relatively common for how we make them is that we leave those juice leaves in contact. And from those juice leaves, those, the cloudiness, um, they get lifted as part of the ferment and you get this beautiful, um, you get an increased textural impact, but yeah. you, get a, you get a reduction in primary fruit in terms of the flavors and the aromatics, but you get this big lift in texture and richness of the wine. And so, and we love that. So um, with the quarter acre wines, they're all, um, hand picked and whole bunch pressed are uh, the whites and they're run to barrel. So we do that. We do that with our Chardonnay, our Sauvignon and our Viognier. Okay. And then, um, and then we allow natural ferment to happen. So it's quite a, quite a volcanic, quite a, um, um, volcanic? quite an effervescent kind of a, sure. a ferment because, <laughs> um, because there's little particles of skin and pulp and things in the juice. It means the CO2 that's produced with the ferment by the yeast means it's got something to grab onto and so you can get like a real volcanic effect where if you overfill the barrels and you don't leave enough room for the for the surface to foam then you get um obviously you get the, the froth well, coming out the top of the barrels and right the science experiment and if you really get it wrong then uh you get quite the eruption out of the top um, <laughs> which is which is not what we're going for in general has that happened to you is it, are you talking from personal experience no of course not uh <laughs> It may have happened when I was on someone else's dime. Uh, it's sure. not something you it wouldn't be, you know, as the guy paying the bills, it's not something you like to see. It's money down the drain. So okay. we try hard not to let it happen, if I'm honest. I would, no, no, no. But I would think, I would think, uh, I'm glad that that would be something I think that you would be taught then, as opposed to having to experience that yourself and, be, and learn totally. from the experience yeah. of it. So yeah. um, that's yeah. something that I wouldn't think about, for example, on my own. Because I don't yeah. make wine, so yeah, you only do it once, Sasha. I tell you, yeah. <laughs> because the same theory, <laughs> the same theory is true in a tank. It, it, the exactly the same uh, uh, kinetics, or same. It's the same logistical issue in a hundred and forty thousand liter tank. And you can imagine if you get that wrong, and you've got an overflowing hundred and forty thousand liter tank. Um, you can end up with 10,000 litres down the drain pretty quickly if you get it wrong. So um, Someone definitely loses their job, I would assume. Yeah, and I can assure you that is not personal experience, but I've seen it happen. That's so awful. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is this quarter acre also. So we're since we're talking about um, four years on this, I think, I mean, it, the, the brightness, the beautiful textural qualities of this, uh, how it ages is it's really remarkable it's still it tastes and smells so fresh um, yeah so so we I guess the our ambition with this wine is that it's it's more more Loire more Sancerre more almost Bordeaux Blanc style in terms of um, its texture and um, and its uh, ageability yeah and ho hopefully ultimately its complexity so um, I guess when we, um, if, if, if I'm thinking about, um, you know, the, the, Stu and I have talked a lot about this because we're a region that, that prides ourselves on our ability to grow things like um, Chardonnay and Syrah. And so Sauvignon Blanc has, for us has always been something that we've viewed with a little bit of, um, uh, I think because Marlborough's had so so much success with Sauvignon Blanc, it's been the it's been the neglected variety in Hawke's Bay, in terms of how much we think about it and how hard we try viticulturally and how <laughs> hard we try in terms of the winemaking. Yeah. And so um, when Stu got involved, the forgotten son, us, the forgotten son, sure. the forgotten son, um, when Stu got involved, he doesn't drink anything but Sauvignon. Really? Um, really, honestly. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so um, maybe beer, that one might be, you know. Yeah. Riesling, um, I love a Riesling as well. Riesling, there you go. And so, um, so he's been nipping away, um, sniping away for the last sort of two years saying, you know, you guys need to try harder, um, make them more interesting. And um, it's not his fault completely, but we definitely, um, we are definitely have an idea in our head that we should be doing a better job with Sauvignon Blanc. And the quarter acre of it was the start of start of it for us. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking for for um, wines that sell well, that are interesting and complex, and that um, that have a drinkability about them, but they're not simple, you know. Um, like I love a glass of Sauvignon Blanc at lunchtime, not too serious, just a crisp, fresh, in your face, um, lovely drink. But I also really love drinking you know, things like Chardonnay and Shannon and Riesling that age amazingly well. And um, and I think Sauvignon has the potential to do that for us in Hawke's Bay um, if we use the same thinking in terms of how we put the wines together. So viticulturally, um, this, is, this is planted on river terraces. So this is 100% from Mangatahi, the 2016. So Mangatahi is that vineyard, that old um, vineyard, terrace vineyard. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, all of these grapes are grown organically. So we, um, we're hundred percent organic um, production now and about 50% certified. So we've got about another 50% to go before we're, we've got another three years to go before we're a hundred percent farmed and certified organic. But, but that's your aim. Anyway. That's where yeah. That's where we'll end up. Yeah. Um, so these grapes were all organically farmed and, um, in the 2016, uh, we hadn't had our certification in the winery at that point, but we have now. And so, so there's nothing particularly clever about the way that we grow our grapes, but it is really hands-on and it is really um, low input. So, you know, we don't use any synthetics. We don't use any weed sprays. We don't use any herbicides or pesticides or anything like that. It's all um, relatively natural. So, um, and we love that what that opens up for us in terms of the way that we make our wines and, and how we, it, it, it sort of opens the door for a whole lot of um, winemaking and technique and and um, and a low input approach in the winery because we know the fruit quality is really good. So um, yeah, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and pour these guys. But I can I ask you, Rod? I have can I ask you some personal questions? Go for it. <laughs> Since you're, uh, I know, right? <laughs> What's your how thought? personal? <laughs> Well, Stu, feel free to jump in and answer for yeah, us. Yeah, I shall. Sure, <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> but um, I'm taking no. it off mute. <laughs> um, when you talk about how long you've been in Hawks Bay and how you got into that, I mean, I'm just sort of curious with with your knowledge and your expertise and and um and how much passion you have for the winemaking today. Two questions that come to mind are: Was there something else you ever wanted to do besides winemaking? And then was there like a turning point that changed that for you? Um, and then uh, two, also, do you like drinking Sauvignon Blanc? Very important question. <laughs> so what was the second one? Do I like drinking Sauvignon Blanc? Sauvignon Blanc, as much as stew. <laughs> and no one likes drinking Sauvignon as much as stew. <laughs> and no one drinks, no one likes drinking as much Sauvignon as much as stew. <laughs> um, so, uh, Actually, like... Rod, Rod, you should tell them that story. We were in Newport Beach at that restaurant. Yeah, yeah that's we right. A... So we were, doing a, we were doing a sales call and um, uh, we were going out for dinner with some friends. Uh, Beach, who are also Laguna on the Beach. trade in Newport Beach, and we were just popping into a bar, and a bar and restaurant that served uh, had our Wild Song, um, which is another wine we sell in the US. We had that on the list, and they had it on by the glass. And so we called in, and um, and there were three of us. Patty was with us as well, and we called Patty in, and um, and we uh, and we so we called in. We had about fifteen minutes before we were due at the restaurant just down the street. So we called in. We thought, oh, we'll have a glass of wine. And then Stu walked in and, um, and, the, and we have a chat to the um, girl behind the bar. And, she, and, so, and then a couple of minutes later, a bottle turns up at our table. So it's like, oh, oh I, guess, I guess we've got time. And so, um, uh, so Patty and I were chatting away and someone came over and we were talking to them and Patty and I had our glass. And then Stu pops up, right, time to go. And it was like 12 minutes later. And he had finished the rest of the bottle while, while Patty and I had our little, you know, 30 mils each. 
So um, it was uh, speed drinking like I've never seen before. But it was <laughs> I was all, thinking like, of it. He, he did it incredibly, it. incredibly sophisticatedly. <laughs> like, no one noticed the fact that he just chopped three quarters of a bottle by himself. Did you use a glass view or just a bottle? <laughs> yeah. You did? Oh, okay. Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, you know, the, it was hot. It was a hot day, cold wine, Savion Blanc from Hawke's Bay. It was, uh, it slid down the throat like nothing else. And, yeah, can yeah. You do that? I they were actually a little annoyed if I remember right. Yeah, well, I was turning around for my second glass and it was all gone. Um, so so that's, uh, that tells you about, um, yeah, I love drinking Sauvignon Blanc, but I drink neither as fast or as much as Stu. Um, but he's a lot bigger than me, so, you know. Um, and the other question around, what was the other question? I know, it was really complicated. I do that. Um, the other question was, you know, before coming. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I thought, oh, I honestly your... thought um, I would be a farmer. My, yeah. Um, yeah, my grandfather, my great, great grandfather, they were sailors. Um, they were um, like sailors for hire captains out of Auckland, which is the city of sales here in New Zealand. It's, it's not our capital city. It used to be, but it's the biggest city in the country and it's surrounded by um, ocean. So I, um, uh, but we went farming up in Northland. Um, my great grandfather started, and then my grandfather, my grandfather was a stock agent, so he used to buy and sell and travel the region looking at other people's farms. And then we had our family farm. Um, the, we farmed until I was about three, and then um, and so I thought for sure that I would be uh, back on the farm every school holidays I could. I was there chasing yeah. cattle around and sheep and and having a, a great time. But um, when I came out of school, um, farming was in a real funk. It was sort of around the late 80s and the global crisis, um, the first sort of global crisis. Uh, share market drop happened in 87. And then we had, um, we had massive, a massive um, cyclone through New Zealand, um, Cyclone Bola, which wiped out a heap of agriculture in the North Island here, and particularly in Hawke's Bay and Gisborne. Wow. And, um, and so, um, so it was just a terrible time. So I ended up sort of um, uh, going through university, not doing particularly well. Um, I was a bit distracted by the everything else that goes on while you're at university. And so, uh, so I ended up working in bars and restaurants and, and, in, and got quite a, into, um, the people who would come and talk to us about wine and I thought that sounded pretty interesting so I ended up um, doing a lot of vineyard visits and then starting writing the wine lists and then uh, I worked my first harvest in 93 um, for a little I winery just out of Auckland and then and then moved to Hawke's Bay straight afterwards and never did anything else so farming I think is probably would have been what I did if I didn't do this and so I've ended up you know yeah. that's the great thing about wine I've ended up um, uh, running, you know, what it, would it be? 100 acres of vineyards and um, just over 100 acres of, uh, of vineyards and and um, and sort of getting my hands dirty, driving around a truck with seeds in the back and fighting frosts and all of that sort of stuff. Oh, that's um, right, it's frost this morning, you guys. You've got to hear about this. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we're spring here, right? Um, we've got leaves on our vines. The shoots are about this long. Okay. about this long so it's early early in the season for us um and we are so we're susceptible to sort of late spring frosts um so last night um the frost alarm went off at the first time at about quarter to 12 and so i was in the vineyard by about 12 30 um turning on the irrigation so overhead irrigation which is how we protect against um, um frost burn and ice and that, that's where it sort of like drops down and then it freezes around the buds and everything. That's correct? it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So like a, a lot of people use windmills, but we're lucky enough to have enough water that we can use the overhead irrigators, which are sort of um, pretty efficient and, and super um, reliable in terms of handling any kind of frost. It can get down to like minus 10 with those irrigators and we don't have any problems. So um, it doesn't often get that cold in Hawke's Bay. I think the coldest frost we've had this year is about minus five okay. Celsius. So... I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's I mean, cold. About, yeah. about late 29s, 28s. Yeah. Hey guys, um, actually interesting, Rod, to talk about the farming side because you'll go into the Syrah now, but um, that is one of the big, that whole um, recession in the 80s was really the, the, the birth of New Zealand uh, vineyards because 
um, in the old days, um, you know, back in the 80s, which is not that old, but um, uh, the government used to um, subsidise. So most of our farmers, um, we were, you know, we were exporting 70 million um, lambs. And if you, so every farmer uh, would just kind of try and produce as many lambs as possible because if they didn't export them, the government would subsidize it. So there was just this mass of um, country being turned into a breeding ground for shipping uh, lambs to, uh, to, La to England. That's where the refrigerator containers uh, were invented in New Zealand at the, our university that Rod and I went to. Anyway, um, so during that whole time, um, and, you know, all the subsidizing, when the subsidization stopped, the farmers had to look at their land and decide, shit, I've got to do something with it. And um, so that's when they started moving into the river terraces and like that. So at the time, you know, all the farmers hated the government, which was Labour. That's, you know, like a, a left of Democrat. And, uh, but it, it made the farmers get off their, their tush and uh, actually do better things with their land, you know, whether it be kiwi fruit or grapes. Um, so most of our farmers became a lot better farmers. Hey, um, we better move on to the Syrah anyway. So uh, mm -hmm. you don't have it ready yet. It looks like most people are getting ready. I like the double swirl. I think it's the fun thing. Yeah, I'm not going to try it. I ended up. It'll be on, end up on the keyboard of my computer. I think if I try to oh, double hand yeah. it. Wonderful. So how, how, when did the label, when did the Mr. label start? So you said Quarter Acre came first, which is about 2012, right? Yep. So the Mr. started when and why, for example? So the Mr. Um, is a, uh, actually the first vintage of, um, so the Mr. morphed out of something we do that's called, we call the one-offs. We've got a one-off range. And as the name suggests, um, it's something we do, um, uh never to be never to be repeated so the one-off range is like um if we have um if we have a new variety or a new style of wine making or a new blend or a, a new um my son's just back um if we have uh, uh something we want to we think is special that we want to bottle and not blend away into into a, a bigger blend and and um and lose we we sell these one-off wines. So we do a little run of maybe 150 cases of um, an un a new clone of Chardonnay or 150 cases of Chardonnay that we've made using um, Hungarian oak or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, or we might do uh, one of the things that's been really successful for us is um, uh, we did a little run of Albarino. There's a little, there's some Albarino just being planted in Hawke's Bay. Oh. So we, we did some of that. Um, we did a Syrah Pinot Noir blend um, that was a red wine. We've got some, we made a Sangiovese Rosé. So all of these things happen in short little runs, 150 to 300 cases, um, just for a bit of fun. And so when we did the label for one of those um, early one-offs, we decided that we wanted to put on the label that um, the sort of flavors and the taste, we basically wanted to put the tasting note on the front label using pictures. And so um, we just had this one label that had a series of little icons on it. So we had a, um, you know, uh, um, Napoleon's hat because we used French oak. We had a, um, we had a, um, uh, we had a duck because it should be served with, um, with uh, um, like game bird or, or whatever. And Brilliant. then um, this lovely young um, design student, Zoe, who was working as a barista in the coffee shop next door to where we had our um, office, um, she'd just come back from university. So we gave it to her as a project to say, make this slightly disjointed, un, un, um, uh, under, mis, under, not understandable label into something that people will get. And so she went off and came up with the little dude and um, put all those things in his hat or in his hand. And so when you look at, when you look at the Mr. Sauvignon Blanc, yeah. you can see um, that, that his hat is basically the food match. So serve with, um, with um, you have to use your artistic license a little bit, but for the Sauvignon, um, so serve with chicken or fish because his hat's made of some kind of bird and uh, some kind of salmon or trout. And then the, the inners, the, the, you can see that parsley, Italian parsley on the right, yeah. uh, lime or lemon on the left. And yeah. then that 
that's a, that's a fennel flower on coming out of his sword. And yep. so those are the aromatics and the flavors that are in the wine. And then his hat is the food match. And then so if you look at the Syrah, yeah. you've got, um, you've got uh, star anise. There it is there, Rod, on the screen. Oh, yeah, cool. So you've got um, star anise, blueberries, violets, and you should eat it with, um, with kind of goose or some kind of Dr. Seuss-looking bird. Um, but it's meant to be like game bird, pheasant or duck or whatever yeah. like that. Um, and then the wine's quite floral. Um, obviously, uh, yeah. and he's wearing, he's got a bow in his, uh, he's got a bow and arrow in his hand because, um, he's been shooting game. So obviously, as opposed to the piercing acidity of the fennel. Ah, his, yeah. brilliant. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a bit of fun. Um, it is fun. but once you know, and you pick up the bottle, very clever, um, very clever. And she yeah. won an award, correct? The the best label. Yeah, yeah. So that the the Pinot we did a Pinot Noir label. So the Pinot won uh, the best red wine label in the UK, um, as awarded by Harper's Magazine, um, uh, which is the big drinks drinks business magazine in the UK. Yeah. Um, so that won the trophy for the best red wine label. They're they're delightful labels, and I actually I love them even more now that I I did not know that story behind it. So it's really great. Yeah. <laughs> so Zoe's just this amazing girl. She's now got her own um, little um, pop up. Well, it's not really a pop up now; it's established. But um, you know, doing um, she called it's called Pixies. They do Buddha bowls and beautiful coffee and food and all that sort of stuff. And she's done fit outs for local restaurants, and she's done heaps of design work. And she's really cool, cool chick. She surfs. She lives at the beach. Amazing. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like a terrible person I would never want to meet. Yeah. Obviously. She yeah. sounds awful. <laughs> and her life sounds absolutely. Yeah, no, her life sucks from what I can see. <laughs> but here, I mean, it's lovely okay. now that I can, we can now talk about this wine and I can reference this label in my, in my opinions. In your and head. My, yeah. <laughs> my notes that I'm getting. But one of the things that I do, this is, this is a very, um, I do get a lot of fruit off of this kind of off the bat as well. Um, I think it does have that floral quality that you're talking about. It's a fairly, it's just an aromatic wine. But there's a lightness to even the aromatics of it, you know. That's um uh that's sort of like very pleasing and very so, inviting. Yeah. So the big thing, the big thing, Rod, and and when I'm in America showing your Syrahs is one the alcohol. Um, it's only twelve or something. Perfect. And two, Wonderful. and and just the completely different style to an Aussie Shiraz mm -hmm. or uh, a, a Napa a Napa. Um, Shiraz, you know, so be kind of nice to touch on that whole difference and and the direction you you know you aim at. Actually, yeah, so also, if I sorry, I don't mean before I go on that, but I'm also so curious because I know whenever I'm reading about Hawks Bay or talking about Hawks Bay, what always comes up are the gravels and the soils and things like that. So I would just wonder how much that affects your wine if that's a part of either of these wines or if that's sort of all hogwash and there's a lot of different stuff to think about. Yeah. So, so I'll try and I'll try and do it. Um, I, I don't want to take you too far over the hour because I know you guys. This is your Friday night, right? So, I'm sure you've all got things to tables to dance on and Absolutely. bars to hit and yeah, we're about to go over and all that sort of and stuff. I, I've got to paint a house after this, so uh, yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm not drinking wine. Yeah. <laughs> um. So the the I guess if I made an overall comment to to take up Stu's um. Uh, gentle nudge. Um, the the thing about Hawke's Bay Sauvignon Blanc is that um, is that uh, we're a cool climate. So so what makes us such a great place to grow Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay is what makes growing red wines challenging. And um, and the um, there's a lovely quote from the guy um, who sailed around New Zealand originally with the sort of first first second European ship to hit our shores who um who oh, and please excuse me i think the frost um the frost has uh, caught up with me who's the dude with the um theory of um evolution darwin. Darwin? darwin so darwin was on the boat with captain cook as he sailed around new I didn't zealand realize that. Oh. and was tra and was noting all of the flora and fauna as he went around and he was famously quoted as saying um, that the closer to the extreme that you plant 
um, that you can plant a fruit tree so the fruit only just ripens, the more intense the flavor and color of that fruit will be, which is a terrible paraphrase of what he actually said. But the intent of it is that if a grape has to struggle, not only for water and for survival, but it also has to um, struggle to ripen its fruit. Um, so, so, you know, in a, in a wine region, if you're, wine, if you're ripening things easily five years out of 10 and, and um, more difficultly eight years out of 10, and then, and then expect that probably one or two years out of 10, you're just not gonna get it there. You're gonna have to do some clever winemaking because it didn't get quite as ripe as you want it to be. Then that's where you're gonna get the most intense flavor. That's where you're gonna get the most, the most um, personality filled wines. And so Syrah is that for us, you know, we don't get it, we don't get it exactly where we want it to every year. So, so our winemaking's gotta to respond to those years where it doesn't quite get there. And so we do that with wine style and winemaking and technique and experience. But, but the thing about growing Syrah in Hawke's Bay is we never end up with those hot climate flavors and styles. We don't get that kind of um, uh, sort of almost overripe porty styles of wines that you can get in hot climates. You always get this, these wines that um, certainly have density and concentration but they also have this beautiful floral aromatic and the acidity plays a big part in the red wine as well. So we align, when we grow Syrah in New Zealand, we align it much more with Pinot Noir than we do with Merlot and Cabernet or with Shiraz, you know. Those, we, we, we search out warm, warm places in Hawke's Bay to grow Syrah, but, um, um, but even when we do that, it's only just warm enough. And so we're much more akin to the Northern Rhone than we are to Australia or California or you know so it's so, so clear it's so clear as well just in the in the in the weight and the flavor profile and that bright bright beautiful acidity in both of these wines yep. um, and just that meaty texture like the quarter acre it just comes off so much more um it, it you get more of that sort of rony meaty kind of quality out of the Syrah yep. also because it has more age but um they're both they're both lean and and beautiful and representing that kind of cool Syrah yeah and so here's the thing sasha the this yeah. is the cool so this is the this is the one out of ten so this is the cool vintage where we really had to work hard to achieve the kind of um balance and and um concentration that we wanted to yeah and so um so you know the 2016 18 19 20 have all been warmer vintages than the 17 i love the 17s because they reflect this beautiful aromatic and they do reflect the vintage that they come from and they're a beautiful drink but they're not um they're not simple wines you know they're they're um and they're not they're not just light they're not just light versions of a darker wine they're actually beautifully balanced um um and representative of the vintage that they come from. And so um, to your point, uh, they both, um, it's a little bit similar to how we've made the Mr. Sauvignon and the Quarter Acre Sauvignon actually. The, um, the wine on the left, the Mr. is 100% from the Bridge Par Vineyard. So that's an old riverbed that was laid down about 50,000 years ago. Uh, and then the river changed course and left the exposed riverbed where it was. And so it's deep, deep alluvial gravels with about a foot and a half maybe two feet of um sort of um, river silts windblown loess volcanic ash and sort of um humus from forests and and more recent farming and all that sort of stuff and so um it's a hundred percent from there whereas the quarter acre is about 70 percent from there and about 30 percent from some of those other sites that we were talking about earlier those hillside sites that really? we planted up and started using as part of our blend um, in, in uh, um, not only for our quarter acre wines. So as, as those areas have grown for us, we've used more and more of them in our quarter acre wines. Mm -hmm. And they also, um, we make our top wine the trademark with those hillside sites. What's the name of the vineyard, Rod? What's the name what of me, the sorry? vineyard? What's the name of that vineyard? The Seeger? Seeger Vineyard? Yeah. Oh, Hovering Hawk. Hovering Hawk, yeah. Yeah. Where does it's the name Hawk's Bay come from? So Hawk um, is actually uh, was a um, an, an English admirable uh, English admiral who won the battle. Um, it was a big sea battle that happened uh, at exactly the same time Cook was um, circumnavigating New Zealand. So that was back in like eighteen forties, eighteen fifties. Yep. 
Um, so uh, back in about the 1850s, this guy Hawk won a famous naval battle against the French in Europe, and so it was named um, after him, Hawke's Bay. I didn't know that, yeah. but... but as it happens, there also is a big um, population of uh, local uh, hawks, which really? cricket. Edward, like his name is Edward Hawk. Because she, pardon me, sorry. His name was Edward Hawk. Edward Hawk. <laughs> Eddie. Um, Eddie. Eddie. Hall. I call him Eddie. Yeah. yeah. So why weren't yeah. we called Eddie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I Eddie know. Bay. It's so it's so formal. Uh, come, to, yeah. <laughs> come to Eddie. Come to see visit yeah. us at Eddie. <laughs> Eddie's Bay. Come on. Yeah. Sure. Eddie Bay. That's kind of cool. Um. So we Maybe are. Maybe it was at... just a little bit formal. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Um. I we are at six p.m. right now, so I don't want to hold anyone over too long. Um. If anyone wants to throw out a question or two, if anyone has something, um, they want to ask Rod or Stu before we go, maybe like one or two questions, just throw it in the chat box or unmute yourselves. Um, um, also, yeah. I'd like to, um, there's, uh, Rod and I did some videos. Um, uh, they were a bit of a laugh. Yeah. Um, as so, soon as lockdown uh, finished, and we, we had lockdown for eight weeks, and then, um, then we were allowed to sort of get around, but we had to, keep social distancing, all the, all the things that you guys are doing now. Anyway, um, we created this 10, uh, 10 video series, and um, so there's 10 episodes. Uh, um, each one is somewhere between four and five minutes long. Uh, so maybe, Sasha, you've got the first one. I think I might have said I've got all of them, Stu. I shared them, I shared them all with my class last month, but right, I will right. I will send them out to everyone in this call. Yeah, yeah. Well. I mean it's they're really cool because yeah. it introduces you to Patty. Um, yes. is, um the episode nine is um Patty and Rod have a bit of a debate about Syrah versus Pinot Noir, why I'm interviewing them with the sun in my eyes. And then uh, and then we go through a, a few different vineyards. I embarrass the shit out of my son. He um, works works with Rod in the winery. Uh, he's he's uh, the, the big young boy that lifts all the heavy stuff. But um, really good to look at these videos, guys. So yeah. take, like I say, they're quick, they're, they're quirky. Um, he, luckily, he cuts out all the, the BS because Rod and I uh, spent most of the time laughing at each other. Um, and then we noticed he didn't put all that in the video, but um, he was a bit cleverer than us. So anyway, I'll uh, be good to look at that, guys. Absolutely. I will, I'll be happy to share that with everyone. Please do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but is there anything else that might come up? Uh, I feel like Rod needs to get like a nap in. We should definitely let him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all good. I'll just I'll are. be tucked up early tonight. Don't you worry. He's usually not that um, croaky. I'm the one with the croaky voice. He's usually <laughs> a little bit more higher pitched, and he's most of he's got his BJ's on underneath. Um, really, if I could ask one last question, just between these two, also in terms of the winemaking. I know we talked a little bit uh -huh. about like the where they come from, but just in the winery as well. Sort of what's yep. what's the difference? Because obviously there is. There's a, a bit of a yeah. I mean, the 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 basic kind of intentions, um, kind of the same, and and so we've got a real Pinot uh, approach to it. So we do a lot of cold soak. Um, what what we so the the um, the Mister Serrara is machine harvested, so it arrives destemmed with about you know ninety eight percent whole berry. So we don't do any crushing. We have a cold soak to to really elevate that aromatic and try and get some spice in it. And then we have a natural ferment. Um, we don't add yeast, and and then we get this real takeoff, and um, and so we'd like to peak out at about thirty-five degrees Celsius in terms of the cap temperature, the the temp temperature and ferment, which is high, but um, we love close the, to hundred, close to hundred Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah. So we we love the um, what we can extract from the skins. Um, as a result of that, um, again, we're using organic fruit, so there's no res no residues or or um, no residual synthetic sprays or anything on those skins so you, we can we can run them hot extract lots of color and and um and flavor and all the precursors to what's going to become complexity once it hits the bottle and then um and that also helps create texture as well we get some higher alcohols as different yeasts kick off and and um so we get this um you know we get the lovely creation of some really nice texture um when that all polymerizes with um and condenses with tannin and then uh and then we, um, it stays on skin for about 
somewhere between 25 and 35 days uh, and wow. then pressed off. Wow. Run straight so to barrel. Post, there's post fermentation maceration that you're doing in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if we can get like, if we can get seven to 10 days pre soak yeah. and then a fast, furious seven day ferment from, from start to finish, that gets us up to about two weeks, mm -hmm. two to three weeks, you know, two, two and a half weeks. And then the last week, week and a half, 10 days on skin just helps polymerize those sort of young, big, clunky tannins into something that's a little bit finer and more chalky. And, um, and the presence of the alcohol um, helps that as well in terms of polymerizing those tannins. So, yeah. so, um, um, so that's the basic technique that happens in a bigger format tank with machine picked fruit for the mister. And then for the, um, for the, uh, quarter acre, what we're doing is the same process, but we're doing it with hand picked fruit. We do a little bit of whole bunch. We don't do any crushing. Um, we do it in smaller sort of one and a half, two ton, um, open top fermenters instead of the upright tanks. Um, uh, and so all of that, all of those, fermentation stuff basic basically the same but it's all done by hand and yeah and then we press it out settle it overnight and then run it to barrel where it stays for sort of six months just sitting on lees quietly in the cold cellar and then come spring we open up the doors things warm up and goes through malo and um yeah. uh and then yeah wrecked, wrecked once and then um stays in barrel for 12 18 months yeah, so, and, but, and the, the mister doesn't see any oak, is that correct? It's all seamless? Or the mister sees it? very little oak, yeah. Very little, okay. Yeah, but yeah. this is 12 weeks so, for that. I think, yeah. Stuart, are you reading that question right there from Dan? Yeah, well, um, the, the interesting thing is trying to sell sell this kind of wine. Um, yeah. It's, uh, we have no problems in New Zealand, um, but when I take it to America, um, one, uh, the media we'll always give our Syrahs and I mean, I mean, our Savion Blancs, the scores and, and they, and then a lot of the media will look at, especially the Mister and, and give it a, like an 87 point and, um, and, and, and then they'll, they'll move on. But um, the other week, um, Robert Parker um, gave Rod's uh, trademark Syrah a 92 and his, and his um, Chardonnay a 93. And, and that was because there was a real qualified um, uh, media person scorer and he basically understood New Zealand styles mm -hmm. where if you just take it into your ba into your normal wine shop, they'll look at it and go, New Zealand, Syrah, uh, it'll be all green and herbaceous and not even think it's going to be any, any, any good. And then you, you smell it and you get some of those peppery notes and, and, and they start making their opinion before they even taste it. So you've always got to be uh, very uh, diplomatic. Um, you've got to be very thick skin, and 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 it really comes. It's really exciting when you show retail, uh, who then show you guys, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sarah, like Patty at um, at um, High Times, and people like her, and, you, and she and she goes, "Wow, this is cool. This is interesting." And then looks at the you know twelve percent alcohol. How did you do that? So the people yeah. who are in the know, it's easy. But it's just introducing it uh, because that big tidal wave of Savion Blanc is really all they're looking at our wine bag and saying, which Savion Blanc have you got? I mean, for me, showing Hawke's Bay Savion Blanc versus Marlborough Savion Blanc is a massive leap in New Zealand, in America, because they don't really know where Hawke's Bay is and everything's come to Marlborough. So then to have a Syrah beside that, it can actually be a bit too much. It's always entertaining. It's always fun. Yeah. So Dan, I'd just really quickly add to that, um, you know, to answer your question, how we do it or what we're doing or how do we differentiate ourselves? We do this, you know, we, um, we, we take every opportunity we can to try wines with people and talk about them. And it's the same with the movies, you know, the movies dive, the, the, the little five minute clips that Stu was talking about before, they dive a bit deeper and they create the conversation to allow us to talk about stuff in a bit more detail and show that we're not just factory. We're not knocking out thousands and thousands of cases of uniform, um, you know, uh, Coca-Cola alternative. It's real stuff from a real place made by real people. And, and the internet's been amazing for that. And things like what Sasha's doing here, that's, that's, that's the playground, you know, that's where we want to be. And, and, uh, and, and we love the opportunity. Thanks, Sasha. Thank you guys so, so, so much. I'm so grateful. You guys are amazing.
truly. Yes, everyone, Un unmute yourselves. Give that, give that. <laughs> yeah, well done, guys. Love it. <laughs> um, truly now, did any of you understand our accent at all? Did that all go all right? It wasn't too uh, severe? We're not, like, Patty, the, our third partner, he, he, when he would be on the Zoom, I don't know how he, how he could talk on the Zoom because he walks and he'll walk away from the screen and then he'll walk back. He, um, Paddy um, runs 4,000 acres of um, sheep and cattle plus his 50 acres of um, vineyard. So he wakes up at four o'clock in the morning and goes to bed at around about 10 o'clock at night. So he's a bit of a workaholic. I don't know how he had three children uh, the old horsey people and all the rest, but he's a, yeah. he's a, he's a, he's a, but he's just so active. He's hilarious. I'll, exp he's I'll explain it to you sometimes, Stu. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother movie. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so next time subtitles would help. But <laughs> yeah. 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 What are you saying? Uh, We're well, actually uh, going to do it all as, um, as stop motion next time. Yeah. It'll, yeah, yeah. It'll be fun. Thank, um, you. That, thank you all very much. I'll let you guys go. If you had a uh, global climate change, really any, any two quick thoughts about that for, for you guys, big impact, little impact. Uh, so yeah, we'll definitely, um, so we're seeing it now. Uh, just so, so without taking, making a, a short question long, we're an Island. We get a lot of weather. Yeah, so global climate change for us is, is um, just a, more of the same in terms of the volatility of what we see every day. We've got a temperate climate. We've got a cool climate, um, but we just have to manage higher highs and lower lows. Um, so I, I don't think you'll see a massive lurch in style from wines from New Zealand as a result or our farming particularly, but um, we'll just deal with the, you know, deal with the volatility. I think probably. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah, our, I think our, our, our issue at the moment is just the whole COVID thing because New Zealand, we don't theoretically have it down here. Uh, we've had little bits of it, um, but we're sort of theoretically COVID free. Um, so the government is, uh, stops anyone coming home, but if, they, if they're a New Zealander, they're legally allowed. So when they get home, they've got to stay com compound for two weeks. So um, they're the only places that COVID is coming in, is in our airports. So they kind of control that. So for us New Zealanders, we're very young. Know, I traveled around the world when I was a 19 year old and we're, you know, we, we're four or five million people and four or five million tourists. So it's our biggest industry that's just fallen off the cliff. Um, so it's a very interesting time for us. We're lucky because the COVID hasn't hit us properly. Um, but then, you know, we're a long way from anywhere, guys. It's, it's, it's a 12 hour flight from anywhere, bar Australia. Okay. Uh, well, I can't wait to take that 24 hour flight and visit you guys sometime soon. <laughs> yeah. <only can>. <laughs> Thanks a lot, fun. guys. Have Thank fun. you very much, gentlemen. Have Thank you all weekend. for coming so much. This has been delightful. Yeah. Have a wonderful rest yeah, of your yeah, Saturday. Yeah. And yeah, everyone yeah, else, we have will. Have a great weekend. Well, See ya. Thanks, Enjoy. everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.